I've had a number of inquiries about uh, students who have been a bit confused by the assignment and so it uh, struck me that it might be time to give you a perhaps a, a clear indication of how the assignment is meant to run. It's not intended to be difficult, by the way. It's intended to be a practical application of some of the work that we did early in the term, in fact, in Module 3. And so what I thought I'd do is go through and just show you what the assignment uh, scenario entails and what the strategy is for solving the modelling and the valuation aspects of it. The first thing we're going to look at is the fact that we have to look at the property as being a combination of both an improvement and the land itself. It doesn't matter what part of the market you take. You can take rural properties, you can take industrial, any type of industrial, uh, retailing, commercial or even residential property. Now we're given you a general expectation for the size of the property. The most important thing really is that it has a tenant or it has some improvements on it which is capable of earning a return, a rent. Someone's going to want to use it. I had one inquiry from a student who was looking at a rural property and I suggested that they could use simply the silos on the property, which in some cases can produce returns, especially during harvest time, of up to $1,000 a week. And so uh, improvements, um, even farm improvements, can be looked at as an independent asset that can be called upon to earn a return in their own right. And in fact, in the rural area, depending on what area you're working, especially say in uh, poultry farms and so on, you can have suppliers who supply various improvements and various resources used on the farm on a rental basis virtually. And so the assignment is an opportunity to look at how we break up the values between the improvements or other facilities that come onto the property and the land itself. So it doesn't matter which type of improvement you take. Uh, most people will be looking at commercial, industrial, perhaps retailing. Uh, as I say, you can also use residential. So what do we do with it? The first thing that we've got to look at is the way that the improvement gives the property its highest and best use. On that, we're able to earn a property rent. Now, the property rent on most improved properties is what someone is going to pay to occupy the space, but a major share, and in some cases the lion's share, actually is a ground rent hidden in the property rent. So how does all that work? Well, in class, again, back in the third module, we introduced the idea of ground rent as being one part of the property rent, improvements or some sort of return of the improvements being the other. We can look at the improvements as simply a financial investment. And so we really put on the hat of the financial investor, the financial manager here. And we say, what amount of the whole property rent would someone having control of the improvements need in order to make taking this position, this investment, worthwhile. So let's look at how the lease is structured. The lease begins with a premium paid by the investor, we're calling them. This is the person who's going to become the lessee. The lessee, the investor, is going to pay a premium, which is going to equal the present appreciated value of the building. So it really means they've paid a price equal to what the value of the building is at this point. In return for that, they get the right to earn all of the property rent. However, they don't get to keep it all. They have to pay the ground rent out. Now, by a simple subtraction, the amount of net income for the investor is simply the property rent less the ground rent. And turning that around, what we can see is that the ground rent is the property rent less the improvements rent. Very simple arithmetic. We've done a self-correcting exercise in this area that I'll show you shortly. Let's look at the data, though, that we need. The data required, first of all, we need the property rent. You can take that from 
prop comparable property rents or existing rent. The amount of detail you go to is up to you, as long as it's defensible. Some people may want to go uh, to a fair bit of detail in getting comparable property rents and so on, and that's fine and that will be definitely preferred. However, others might simply take the existing rent or simply an estimate taken from discussions with a real estate agent. And all of that works. It's a matter of how much time you've got, how much um, effort and interest you want to put into establishing that piece of data. Next thing is the value of the building. Now I'm suggesting that if you go back to your property valuation, Prop 11001 notes for the cost approach, you'll find there's a lot of work uh, given to you in that, a lot of ways of working out the value of a building. So any reasonable estimate, if you're working in a situation in the building industry or in the property industry and you have intelligence on the value of buildings in your locality, that's fantastic. For many people, it'll be a matter of going to Rawlinson's. Again, go back to the notes that you had, uh, the extract of Rawlinson's that you would have had from Prop 11001 uh, for Rawlinson's. They're actually available uh, through the library Discover It as a Crow, a course resources online for Prop 11001, so you can get a perhaps more up to date. Uh, as an extract from Rawlinson's if you wish. But if you use Rawlinson's, you get a cost per meter to build whatever it is that you're building, and you simply take away the depreciation estimate, which can be as simple as the proportion of the remaining life. So if you've got a building and you estimate it to have a 40 year economic life, and it's about 20 years old, that means you're going to apply a depreciation of about 50%. Again, some people might want to take this bit of estimation into more detail than others. Some may merely go to Rawlinson's and do a bit of a ballpark estimate of about how old the building is. We're not expecting the building to be um, estimated in terms of its age down to the nearest month or what have you, as long as it's a reasonable estimate. The important thing is how much life is left in the building. And most of the time, perhaps with consultation with a local agent or what have you, you may be able to look at the building and say, well, I think in about 20 years' time, that's probably going to be pretty past its use-by date, whatever. Again, fairly fair bit of variation in how you do that. The depreciation can be simply a straight line. You know what? Proportion of its economic life is still remaining. Quite straightforward. Then we want to look at the length of the lease. Well, we've already done an estimate of the remaining economic life. We're saying if it looks like it's going to be more than 30 years, use 30. Now, some people say, well, what's going to happen after the lease has expired? Well, in fact, it doesn't really matter to the investor. The investor is putting up a certain amount of money up front. And for that, they are getting a cash flow, which is the difference between the property rent and the ground rent. And that difference has to give them an annuity, a cash flow over the period of the next 20 or 30 years, whatever it's going to be is going to be sufficient to repay their initial premium. That's all it is. And you use, of course, the discounting function there. So you use the PMT function in Excel. And so the remaining economic life, uh, which in this case is going to be the length of the lease. And if the building has still got a bit of life in it at the end, well, that doesn't really matter because from the investor's point of view, hopefully they will have organized themselves so that they've paid off their premium investment at their discount rate, so they're happy. The owner might end up with a, an old building, but perhaps serviceable or what have you. They get to decide whether they pull it down or they still keep tenants in it for a bit longer. But that reversion isn't really important in this exercise. Last important issue here is the investor discount rate. And as long as you get a reasonable estimate. Now, this is a difficult value to find in the market you can work it out in terms of what you think somebody would be likely to invest their money in something which has these kind of risks. And again, any defensible, any reasonable estimate will be fine for this assignment. Some people might want to go further than others. At the very least, you ought to be discussing things like the risks of owning the building, maybe the tenancy risk and so on, knowing that you have to pay the ground rent regardless of what's happening. You might also want to look at the physical risks with the building and so on. 
Uh, so they are the risks, so you'd expect a discount rate uh, higher than general property, perhaps because you don't have the advantage of that sweetener of owning the land at the end of the investment period. So it's going to require someone to be interested in investing at a higher rate. You might look at that in terms of how it compares to the risks associated, say, with the um, stock exchange or what have you. Some people want to take that further than others. Some people might want to, may not want to take it further than simply looking at what return can you get on, say, a fixed deposit, that's like money in the bank, add a few percent of risk, uh, and I'd expect sort of numbers somewhere in the teens, uh, so somewhere probably around 12, 13, 16 percent. Some people might be ambitious and say that they'd only do it for 18 percent. I think it's probably a bit on the high side. But at probably low teens is probably the numbers that you're probably going to come in with. However, I'll leave that up to you. The importance here is not so much the absolute precision of the number, but the arguments you have around it, the amount of work you want to do with working out that investor rate. This is illustrative in the assignment. It's not as though 14% is right and 15% is wrong. It's a matter of what is a defensible estimate. And some of you might run your numbers and find that at some estimates, for instance, if you use a very high discount rate, you'll probably find the thing just won't stack up at all. It'll be impossible to get it to work. And so you have to put your horns in and say, well, what would be the lowest discount rate, the lowest rate of return that an investor would be willing to put in? And obviously, if they can't get a better deal, say, by putting their money in the bank or putting money into shares, what have you, as much as shares are perceived as fairly risky, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, so this is something you need to give a bit of thought to. Basically, investment world and the property world all has risks, and hopefully there is some kind of proportion between the risks you take and the return that you expect. So that is admittedly a little bit rubbery, but on the other hand, I don't want you to lose too much sleep over it, but I do want you to think about it so that you can take this into your professional lives. Last number that you need to calculate is the yield on the land value. Now, all of these above values are all there so that you can work out the ground rent. And ultimately, this ground rent is really important. How do we turn the ground rent into the land? Very, very simple. We simply capitalise. And capitalisation is very straightforward. You simply divide the rent by the yield, which all of you should be familiar with by now. It goes back, well, we've, we've dealt with that in a few different places. That simple division. However, to do the simple division, assuming you have the ground rent, which comes from processing all of these above numbers, you need the yield on the land value. How do we get the yield on the land value? Well, it's relatively straightforward to get the yield on the property. You can look at comparable sales with tenanted properties and look at the rents they're earning and so on. And uh, you can adjust that by the age and so on. So getting the property yield is fairly straightforward. How do we get the yield on land values? Well, to do that, ideally, we would want comparable instances of ground rents, places where the land has been sold or is somehow reliably valued, and there is a rental estimate, a ground rent available. Now, you may not find that very easy to come across. So there's another way. And the other way is simply to say, well, let's look at the property yields. I can look at the property yields for my particular market. Property yields appear to be somewhere in the vicinity of, well, who knows, let's say 10%. And so if the entire property is running on a yield, a ratio between the rent and the value of, let's say, 10%, what should the ground yield be, the yield on the ground rent, on the, on the land value? Well, if you give some thought to that, it comes back to something similar to the questions you're looking at in the previous estimate of the investor discount rate. It comes back to the comparison of risk. Now, I invite you to give some thought as to whether the risk on earning the ground rent is higher or lower than the risk on operating an entire property. I would suggest that in most cases, it would be more risky trying to find tenants for a developed property than it would be sitting on a guaranteed lease of the land alone. Why am I saying that? Because once this investment strategy is set up, the landowner 
knows that they'll either get the ground rent or if the investor defaults, they'll end up with the property back in their hands. So they'll be able to earn the property rent. And even if there's a bit of vacancy or maybe the property rents are a bit lower than most people expected, by having the whole property back in your hands, you're certainly going to earn more than the ground rent. And so the failure of the investor will actually reduce the risk and increase the returns to the landowner. Because once they you know, are able to enjoy the entire property rent, that's going to be higher than the ground rent. I hope you can sort of follow the logic there. But what it means is that the landowner is in a very secure situation, especially in this strategy once the lease is in place, because the lease covers the entire property, which is considerably or significantly more valuable than the land alone. What does this say? It says that the yield on the land value is most probably going to be or should be lower than the yield on the entire property. And so if in the example we're looking at, we find that the yield on properties in this particular market, this particular locality is 10%, then we'll probably look at putting a yield on the land values in the absence of other information or other evidence, probably a little bit higher, maybe 10 and a half, maybe 11%. 10.5 would probably be easier to defend than, than 11 or 12. Uh, again, any defensible number. The evidence of having thought through these issues in your report will be very highly favoured. And so I recommend that you at least give that some thought. And really, in this report, evidence of having thought through the issues, because the issues here are quite live issues. It's not as though there's a single, simple answer. However, let's just look at the modelling that needs to be done now because a number of students are saying, well, this assignment looks like there's actually two assignments because I've got to run a, a model and I've got to do it with the student data set and then I've got to do it with the field data. So I'm really doing two assignments in one. That's really dreadful. In fact, you're not. To do this, you need to build yourself a ground rent model. Now, it turns out that you've already got that from one of the exercises in the uh, module three, self-correcting exercises. Let's just have a look at that. Here we have the fifth exercise in the module three, self-correcting exercise. And you'll see that's simple ground rent, so that's fairly straightforward. And if you read through the description here, you'll find a situation not unlike what I'm asking you to do in the assignment. It's a little bit different, but basically the mathematics is the same. When we look at what's required in this model, we find that there's only three equations that you need to do. That's a fairly simple model. However, I don't want you to simply take this model and then paste it into your report. I would like you to build your own model, which means I'd like it to look a bit different to this one, as much as the mathematics should be the same. Now, I'm concerned about the precision of the mathematics. I say this is a fairly simple model to build, but I would like to feel that my students kind of graduate out of my courses knowing how to do sums and get the correct answer. Now, it's a little bit difficult for me to go through and rework all of your data for each assignment. And so what I'm asking you to do is once you've built the model, which is going to be your own appearance, but doing basically the mathematics in this exercise, I'm going to ask you to simply do it, put the data in of a dummy run, if you like, of the model. The dummy run of the model comes to you from the student data set. In the student data set, most of you should have opened this already. It's a little spreadsheet, which is in the assignment section of the middle page. Uh, you put in your student number or the digits of the student number. You'll notice I've just put in the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 here to get a student number, and it's given me the data I need. I'm pretty sure that you'll find that this gives you everything that you need in order to solve the problem and the idea is that by giving you this it gives you an idea of what sort of data you need to find for your case study so I'm giving you the property value in fact that's not that important the property rental gross I'm giving you the operating costs from those you can get the net rental and from that you can work out the yield which is useful uh, here I'm actually giving you a yield on land to make it easier uh, originally, I was anticipating that you could work that out yourselves. However, 
uh, it's probably easier if I give you the yield and the land. However, getting a set of, uh, of, we are getting ahead of ourselves, giving you the property rental and the operating cost so you can get the net rent. We've given you the building replacement costs, the remaining economic life, and the applicable depreciation. So if we take 35% in this case off the $2.332 million, that will give us the current depreciated value of the building. We've got the economic life of 26%. We've got the investor's discount rate. We put that into the Excel PMT function, and that will give us the annual payment that the investor will require to pay off the investment that they'll make, which is the premium, which will be the premium equal to the depreciated value of worked here. Oh, by the way, the investor's discount rate needs to be moderated, needs to be compounded with the property growth rate, because that annuity is going to grow over time. And so first thing you need to do is work out the compound discount rate. We've done that on a number of models, so I'd expect that that should be fairly straightforward. It's basically compounding 3% and 10% together. The last step after you've worked through that, because that will give you the ground rent, is to then capitalise the ground rent using the yield on land. And as I say, I've given you the yield on land in the model, so that should be a very easy calculation. Last thing I'll point out is that the student data generator comes as a model which has got tabs available so that you can build your model onto the spreadsheet and simply attach it, um, submit it as well if you want. I'll actually be primarily grading your report. Um, I won't necessarily be going into your modelling unless I sort of find something peculiarly going on and I want to go back and do that, but in most cases I won't. However, we've set this up so that there's three basic pages. There's the class data model, which will be the model uh, that you build uh, from the uh, module three ground rents exercise. You do that using the data from the class data. You then copy that model onto another sheet, which is the field study model. And in that, you simply put the data that you've got in the field, which is it's the same variables, property, rent, and so on. However, with the values that you find in your case study, basically put that in and that's done. Now the report overall will look like a, uh, a valuation report because ultimately our major uh, focus is going to be on estimating the ground rent and the land value. And so you can use the form of reports so we've got examples, but sort of basically trimming it down because the product is primarily ground rent and land value. Last thing, this is really taking us through the core exercise. If you want, you can do the extension exercises. They're laid out on the uh, assignment outline. And so... Uh, if you have the time and the interest, you're most welcome to take those on as well. And I think after you've done this exercise, uh, they should be fairly straightforward to add on. For those of you who have the, the, the time and the resources to be able to do those extension activities. Hopefully, this video should give you everything you need to confidently go through and do the assignment. Say so there's lots of places where you can do the assignment either in a fairly straightforward way, uh, a simple way if you are in a bit of a hurry and just want to do it simply, or you can go to town, uh, go through the issues kind of lurking within the various uh, variables and so on you have to estimate and, and so on and, and, and taking it that much further. That gives you a fair bit of flexibility in how you approach the assignment, but basically the maths of it and what's required is fairly simple and straightforward.